Good afternoon or good morning. Welcome to today's webinar where we are going to dig into color grading uh, and talk about that and go through all the various different methods and uses you can use of the color balance tool and also combining that with a few other tools as well today. Uh, if you're in our webinar room, uh, welcome to you guys. If you do want to ask a question, uh, just some advice, try to add it to the Q&A tab that just keeps it out of the chat so we don't get mixed up as Diego is in there uh, answering questions as well. If you want a bit more space, then you are welcome to hide the chat just by clicking that arrow and then you'll see Capture One a bit bigger on the screen as well. If you're on uh, Facebook or YouTube, then thanks for joining there too. And of course, you're very welcome to ask questions there and we've also got people uh, Yulia and Diego looking out on those channels as well and we try to answer as many questions as possible. So let's dive straight into it. So what we're mostly looking at today, if I remember to just turn on my little uh, mouse tool, uh, is this guy. Why can't we see it? Hang on, let's just open up a picture, that would help. <laughs> is this guy over here in the left hand corner, the color balance tool. And as I said, we will combine it with a couple of other tools as well to really get uh, the full benefit out of it. But primarily this tool has two uses. It can be used for creative color grading, so that could be doing something like this. And you can see the little dots have moved around the color balance tool. We'll explain what that is in a second. Or it can be used for correction purposes. And we're gonna have a look at this photo later to talk about how to get rid of the color cast and just even up the color balance to be something a bit nicer. We can use it without layers and we can also use it with layers. We can also use it with luminosity masking and all those things combined together just make it a little better and a more powerful tool. So let's start off simple and then we will uh, kind of increase from there. So let's go back to this shot, why not? Actually no, before that, we're gonna bring up a chart and then look at exactly how the tool works before we get ahead of ourselves, David. So the color balance tool is split up into a master wheel and a three-way wheel. Now these three uh, items here, shadows, midtones, and highlights, they are exactly the same as these three wheels here. They're just presented bigger if you need a bit more precision uh, when you're coming to use them. So the master tab, and I'm just gonna work on this uh, TIFF file, it's just a black to white gradient. So with the master tab, this affects the whole photo. And the best analogy I can give, it's like picking up a colored filter, placing that in front of your lens, and then that will tint the overall picture to that color. So if we grab the little central point here, and then just move this towards the warmer tones, then you see the whole photo gets warmer photo in inverted commas. If we go in this direction, then you can see the whole tonal range gets cooler. Now to reset back to zero, double click anywhere in this space, and then it will bring it back to the central point like so. So that's what the master tab does. As you'll see later, that's, that's very useful for giving like an overall warmth or an overall coolness uh, to the photo. And it's particularly useful if we're using it on a sequence of pictures too. So if we go to the three-way tools, this is essentially chopping up the picture into its shadows, midtones, and highlights. Now this is preset, so the cutoff between shadow, midtone, and highlight is preset. That's not something you can change unless we start digging into using luma ranges, which we will do as well. So to give you an idea of what area affects what, uh, if I grab up the central point, and just pull this all the way over to the blues, you can see it affects the darkest colors and cuts off around here. If we look at the histogram, it's kind of about 30 odd percent in, which is what we would expect. Midtones, let's just go to the opposite so we can see the difference. You can see it's spanning this middle range. If I move the cursor back and forth, you can see how the line is moving on the histogram too. Now, if we just grab the highlights and go in that direction, you can see it's affecting the brighter portion. Again, roughly a good even split between shadows, midtones, and highlights. You'll also notice that's not on the master tool. That's this slider at the right hand side. On the three way tool, we have an additional active slider, and this controls the density of each of those zones. 
So uh, if we pull this one down, you can see that makes it darker. If we grab the midtones, you can see it makes it lighter. If we grab the highlights, then obviously it makes it darker. So that's just an additional tool to control density, um, contrast as well. So it's an extremely simple tool to use. The mechanics of it are very basic. So any of you should be able to get started up and running as quick as possible. So now let's look on a real photo and use it in its most simplistic basic sense. So a great shot here from Michael Clark, Fujifilm ambassador, Elenchrom ambassador as well. Nice action shot with a 100 megapixel, which is uh, pretty impressive. So first of all, let's grab our crop tool and just make this a bit more dynamic. And before, <coughs> excuse me, we dig into using the color tool, let's just give this a quick edit. So I'm gonna warm it up slightly. Uh, we're gonna open up the brightness a little just to get a bit more light into the midtones. Down here we have a fairly strong highlight, so let's just pull that down a touch. <coughs> Excuse me, and open up the shadows slightly and darken our blacks. There we go, that will do as a good start point. Oh, let's add some clarity as well, as it's nice and sharp, we can probably afford a few points of structure. There we go. So we're at the point now where we've made our edit and we're thinking, you know what, I'd like to do some creative color grading. So moving over to our color balance tool. By the way, if you've got the uh, screen real estate to do so, or a second monitor, you can lift out the color balance tool and you can make it larger as well. So if you're working on a big monitor or you have second monitors, this is one of those tools that you can enlarge uh, to make its use a bit easy. Okay, so first of all, no reason why we can't combine master and three-way. So I'm gonna pop a bit of extra warmth in just by picking up the central ball and moving towards the warmer tones around here. This would be more red, obviously, but I wanna make sure it's extra warmth, like so. Now, when it comes to three-way, we can do a bunch of different things. They could all be the same color. They could be different colors. Uh, generally it helps if they are complementary. So a very common kind of cinematic color grade is to move the shadows towards the teal areas or cool areas, and then boost up the midtones in the opposite direction with something a little warmer like so. Now, if we want to influence contrast, we can also use the sliders on the right hand side as mentioned earlier. So if we pull this down, that will darken those shadow areas. If we bring this up, that would brighten the highlights, but I don't want to do that too much because we're going to lose detail here. Uh, but I'll just open up the midtones a touch as well. So super simple to use, gives us uh, really, really nice results. Now the only limiting factor of this, which is where we're going to move on to layers uh, after probably another edit, is that if I've decided, you know what, I think I've I've overdone this a bit, it's a little bit too much on the strong side, I'd like to reduce the impact, then I'd have to go to each individual one and then play around a little bit, which is slightly cumbersome. But nothing wrong with operating on the background layer if you wish. Let's see our before and after, so that's how we started, and then with our edits and our color grade we got to something like that. Uh, just to give you another uh, quick example, so if we take this guy, uh, if we wanted to just, let's just reset that. Pretty good shot out of the box. I don't think there's a huge amount of editing that's been done with this one, very little actually. Let's just auto the levels so we have a bit more contrast. Situation like this, the snow, it's a bit on the cold side, but I like the, you know, the jacket is a pretty accurate color. So if we just did that, then we could stick a bit of extra warmth in the snow like so. So it's a really useful tool just for even a quick immediate kind of task like that as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the full creative um, input. Before we get on to layers, let's just, or am I gonna come back to that? No, we're, we're actually do some layers and then we come back to a few different additional cases. So we stick to the, the main use of it first of all. Okay, so why would I want to 
work on a, a layer. So let's go and pick a different photo. Let's grab this one on a similar theme. Gonna reset it so it's back to its default. So again, Michael Clark again, 100 megapixel action shot, which is always pretty cool. Uh, again, I'm just gonna crop this down a bit so we've got slightly less foreground, something like that. Exposure's pretty good, maybe ever so slightly hot. So let's just pull the exposure down a tad. Highlights looking pretty good. Maybe on his crash helmet, we could bring the whites down a touch just so we're getting a bit more density in that and then slightly warmer on the white balance. So he's got a pretty cool retro vintage looking helmet and so on. So let's try and go for a more slightly retro look. First of all, just going to rotate slightly. So it doesn't look like he's falling in the wrong direction. There we go. So something like that. So this time, what's the benefit of doing it on a layer? So first of all, gives us a bit of flexibility for change and gives us the ability to use some other tools as well. So what we need to do to work on a layer is to first of all, add a new field adjustment layer, like so. Why do we want to fill it? Because we essentially want to grade the entire image. So if I press M on my keyboard, we're going to see a layer over the whole shot. So it's essentially like working on the background, but as I said, it's going to give us some additional flexibility and the ability to add more than just the um, color balance tool in there as well. So essentially we're going to do exactly the same thing. So uh, let's try to go for something kind of filmic. So let's do a similar action once more. This time let's also warm up the highlights to some extent as well and not quite as harsh on the shadows. Also when you're color grading, I mean the, the hardest part is not using the tool, that's easy. The hardest part is actually deciding which direction to go in. But there's another little tip I can give you in a second. So now we've done all of this on this layer which we're gonna name color grade like so. So we've got our color grading layer, pretty happy with that, looks good. Let's push it a bit stronger actually. So kind of max it out and then we're also going to drop our shadows slightly and then brighten our midtones a little bit as well. So we're looking at this, if we do our before and after, that's how we started and that's how we ended up like so. Now you might be thinking, okay, perhaps I've pushed it a little bit too much or, or the effect is just too strong. On our previous example, we had to then go back and fiddle with all you know, the different adjustments, which is not necessarily super efficient. So the much simpler and smoother way to do it is that now that we're on a separate layer, we've got the opacity slider. So I can go from anywhere to no color grade to somewhere in between. So I could say I'd probably like it somewhere like that. So you have the opacity to do so. Also, we could add in some other things. Perhaps we'd like to desaturate it to some extent so it's the colors are more muted. So that's kind of nice as well. Perhaps we would like to you know, add some additional contrast into that grade as well. So this is a layer that you can play with and see what it's doing, you know, tweak and refine it and adjust it. And again, if it's too strong, we could just back off the opacity a bit. We could also add further tools in there as well. So if we grab the color editor, let's just go advanced for maximum flexibility, grab the color picker. If I pick uh, the sky, I could then push the hue in that direction or this direction. So this direction that will just walk it round to the more teal areas and take some of that blue out if I want to mute it further, like so. So all of those different things can be combined into a singular color grade layer. So again, we can turn that off and back on again, which gives you that flexibility of the opacity. So personally, unless you think, unless you're looking at the photo and you're thinking, okay, I know exactly how I'm gonna color grade this, um, I've got the feeling how it's gonna look good and everything, then yes, you could do it on the background layer without too much issue. But to get the maximum flexibility and probably the best end result, it always makes sense to pop it on an additional layer like so. 
Okay, um, good question from Joel. Can you please discuss the use of the color balance tool versus the white balance tool? Um, between the master tab, there's not a huge amount of difference, I would say, but remember when you're playing around with white balance, you are affecting the whole shot. And you've got the Kelvin slider, and of course you've got the additional, um, what's the word I'm looking for, additional settings uh, of the tint slider as well. And it's always operating on the whole shot. So I think it's always a good place to start to have the correct white balance, if you like. So if we just make another virtual copy of this one, let's do a new variant like so. Like this one, white balance wise, it's a little bit on the cool side, personally. Uh, just looking at you know his clothing and helmet and the tone of the road, it's probably a little bit cool. So even if I was gonna color grade this, I'd probably start with a neutral style point because then you can go either way as, as well. So they do have you know, a, different, a different task in that respect. And of course, don't forget your three-way is affecting those different areas. The white balance tool is always gonna affect the entire shot. Uh, what's the shortcut I'm using in to zoom in really quickly? Yeah, if you're on the, probably it's this. So if I'm on the pan tool and we double click, then it zooms to 100%. If we double click, then we zoom back out. You can also use a shortcut key to fit screen. Uh, where is it in the viewer? Here it is. Uh, so you can also set a shortcut key to this. I've actually got it set as dot and colon. So if I tap dot, it goes to 100% colon fit screen. So that's um, easier than going a plus minus unless you wanna go in steps. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Let's go. All right, so um, where were we? Let's check the notes. So again, looking at that, I think that's a bit strong, so I'll probably come back to something like that. I'm also staring at a bright light, which makes this kind of thing <laughs> tricky as well. All right, what's um, next on the list? Okay, so um, we've talked about splitting up shadows, midtones, and highlights. That's a preset, you don't have any control about that. But what if you wanted to, you know, color grade just the deepest shadows or a particular area or, you know, a broader range of highlights or, or something like that? Then it would make sense to use an actual luma range. So if we grab this shot as an example, uh, let's make a new variant. So there's no adjustment. So this is as it came out of the camera. If we pick up the, let's just grab the shadows and just crank that all the way over to the blue, then you can see it affects this area mostly, but there is a little bit going on on the concrete as well. So if we just go dramatically back and forth, it is having an, an effect there as well. It's just sneaking over into those zones, especially on, you know, like the darker areas. So how would we just really target our color grading to a particular area? Well, of course you can just draw a mask. So if I just did a crude mask like this, hang on, if we just press M on my keyboard and just do a crazy mask like this, then obviously when I go to do my um, color grading, go away mask, thank you, uh, then it's only gonna affect that masked area like so. So you can, of course, manually pop a mask in and then it's only gonna affect at that point. Now, obviously that looks silly, so let's reset that. And we're gonna go for a new field adjustment layer. So that, again, that's a layer over the whole shot. But don't forget, we can always add, in addition to that, a luma range. So what luma range does is place a constraint on any mask that you've drawn or filled, made with a filled mask, and restricts it to a certain tonal range. So that could be the highlights, could be the midtones, uh, or it could be the shadows. So in this case, if we really wanted to target just this area, first of all, I would turn on the grayscale mask. The grayscale mask hides the photo and shows you the mask as a series of gray tones. So white, as you see on screen now, is showing white because it's fully masked. Now, if I turn on the luminosity range and I said I only want the shadows, so I wanna keep the shadows, so this is my shadow area, and cut out 
the highlights and the midtones until I get to just my skater dude in the middle like so. So that's pretty good. We've got this little line here which we can fix later. Without using these two sliders underneath, radius and sensitivity, the edge of the mask will be quite crude. It won't be particularly refined. It won't be particularly soft. So what I would advise is always open up the radius a bit because then this activates the sensitivity slider. Let's zoom in to 100% actually so we can see what's going on. We can always go back into the Luma range and change it at any point so it's not fixed. So if I bring sensitivity to zero, you see it feathers the edge, which can be useful. If we bring sensitivity to 100, it refines the edge. As we increase the radius, it will increase the sample zone of, of what we're looking at between the edge of the mask where it goes from black to white, if you like. So as we increase the radius, you see it starts creeping further in because it's sampling a, a wider area. So I would back this off a little bit until we got to something like that, which gives me a nice finessed edge, but it's not creeping into my mask too much. So now we've got this. Now we've got a few bits down here because they're a similar tone to the dark shadow and uh, the skater here. So if I want to get rid of that, I can just grab my eraser and then we can just take out those little bits like so. And then the resulting mask, let's make this smaller, looks pretty good just on the rider itself. So now if I press M on my keyboard, you can see exactly where the mask is. So now we're free to do what we want. So if I use the master tab, we could cool that bit down, we could warm that bit up, we could do exactly what we wanted. So then you might be thinking, well, I'd love to do something to the background as well, color wise. Can't really do it on my background layer because that's going to affect potentially everything. But I've already got this layer, which is a pretty good, you know, cut out of this. So the inverse of that could be very, very useful. So we're going to make a new layer. And as we've already done the hard work on this layer, we can right click on it and simply copy that layer and it will grab the layer and the luminosity constraint that we've done at the same time. So let's just uh, name this rider. And this one's gonna look exactly the same because it's just a straight copy. But what we want to do is have the inverse of that. Now if I, this is where you might go a bit, uh? so if I was to invert that now, it probably wouldn't have the result you would expect. Because if you remember, we started with a field mask, we put a luminosity constraint on top of that, which gave us our nice little cutout of the rider. And then we erased a few bits, these pieces down here that were kind of interfering with our mask. So the result is this, like so. But if we were to invert that, forget about the luminosity mask, take that out of your brain. If we were to invert that, then we would have this kind of bit filled in here where I'd done that with a luminos luminosity constraint over the top. So you probably wouldn't get the result you're expecting. If you do want the result you're expecting, what we can do is right click and say rasterize. And what that will do is, eventually, is essentially set the mask as you see it now with your own eyes. So imagine if we'd carefully drawn around that rider and his skateboard and everything, by rasterizing, we're gonna lock the mask as it is. So we're going to throw away the luminosity, we're going to forget about um, the other edits I made and simply lock the mask as we see it with our eyes right now. So if I say rasterize, that little sun symbol goes away and now we have this mask. And to invert it now, I can just right click and say invert mask. So now I've got the perfect opposite like so. So if we want to do something different with this one, then we can do so. So now I can flip between my two layers and do exactly what I want to do. So if those zones aren't working for you, you can really build your own by using uh, luminosity masks. Okay, uh, just checking on your questions. Clive says, can you use the Luma range to restrict the mask to a certain color? No, you would use the color editor for that. 
So we don't have a color really in that shot. So let's go and find what could we use just looking at this selection. So if we grab this gentleman and very quick, uh, who was asking that Clive, as it's slightly off topic, but I'll let you off. Um, if we click on his um, coat, that gives us our suggested color range. If we turn on view selected color range, everything will go to monochrome that is not part of that range. So if we want to cut out the background, we could take out the lower saturated stuff, but that's a pretty good selection. I'd hope you agree, Clive. And then we would say in the little three dots here, create mask layer from selection. Takes one second or so. And now if I press M on my keyboard, you can see the mask that we've got. Uh, if we want to look at that in grayscale, then you see it's picked up a few other bits, but there's nothing to stop you grabbing the eraser, making our brush a bit bigger, and then just having a quick clean up around those areas. You might want to spend a bit more time uh, around this bit. I'm just going to be crude like so, and then you've got a pretty good selection of Justice sweater. So color editor for color, luma range for luminosity. Okay, uh, right, where was I as I was slightly off track? Uh, so we've used layers. So what are we gonna do next? Okay, so let's look at a sequence of shots. So I just wanna make sure these don't have any adjustments on them. Just a clone layer on that one. So let's uh, select these three at the same time, like so. So let's say you wanted to do a quick warm up or a quick cool down or a quick color tint of these three shots at the same time. Now, if I did a copy paste of the white balance and maybe going back to, sorry, I can't remember whose question it was, Joel, maybe about what's the difference between white balance and color balance, maybe this is also a good thing to listen to as, as well. So if I was to copy paste the white balance across to these three shots, if we actually look at them, they all have a slightly different white balance. So they all look you know, pretty good. If I saw these as a sequence, I wouldn't think they were out of place. This one's maybe you know, a bit cold, but they fit together nicely as a sequence. But if I'm looking at it retrospectively and thinking, you know what, for this sequence of shots, I wish I'd gone a bit warmer or a bit colder. You've got a couple of choices. One thing you can do is use speed edit with the white balance control. And if you don't know what speed edit is, if we look at edit keyboard shortcuts and then speed edit keys, uh, you'll see a bunch of keys down here which activate some of the basic adjustments in Capture One. Note key number one and two is Kelvin and Tint. So what I'm going to do is very simply, you can see my keyboard, hold down number one on my keyboard, keep your eyes on this guy up here. So if I press and hold down number one, notice that I can see the Kelvin value of each of those shots. And look at my uh, Wacom now. So imagine this is just a giant slider. As I click and drag back and forward, you can see all of the white balance sliders move by a relative amount. So if I'd copy pasted those over, then I'd end up with all the same white balance, which is not necessarily what we want. Uh, by using speed edit, it's a relative adjustment. So they all increase by the same amount or decrease by the same amount, but at a relative way. So they're not all now sharing the same white balance. So if I felt, you know what, wish I'd gone for a cooler look, we could achieve it like that. Or if I wish I'd gone for a warmer look, we could achieve it like that just by using speed edit. Point about speed edit. If we look at this button up here, edit all selected, this has an influence on how speed edit works too. Generally, this is a toggle for do the thing or do the action to all the shots or just the primary selected one, which is the one with this thicker white border around it. So with it on and I press and hold one, you saw that it affects all the shots. If I turn this off and now I hold my number one key down, you see it's only affecting the primary. So this is also useful if you're trying to balance a white, white balance or a look between each of the shots, then you can do so individually. 
So that's using white balance. But if you wanted to, you could also use uh, the color balance tool. So uh, let's just cool these down a bit so the demo is slightly more convincing. So we've started with, you know, a little bit cold. I'd like to warm them up a bit. So what we can do is, with the color balance tool, is just use our master one. So I'm going to bump up the warmth to something like this. And I want to copy and apply that to the other two shots. So in each of the tools, we have a little copy and apply button. So you can either do it the slow way, which is to click that and then say apply. But there's a handy shortcut down here, which says uh, hold down to suppress this dialogue, hold down option to copy or shift to copy and apply. So all I need to do is hold down my shift key, click on this up down arrow, and then it's going to copy the same color balance across. Let's just dramatically go in the other direction so you can see shift click and now it's moved across like so. So whatever tool you prefer to use, Speed Edit works quite nicely, the Color Balance tool works quite nicely, but the crucial thing about using Speed Edit and the Color Balance tool is that it's a relative adjustment. We're not resetting them all to the same amount. So copy pasting a white balance doesn't necessarily work because these two gents could be shot in the shade. This guy's got a bit more sun on him, so he's probably gonna be slightly warmer by default. So they're not gonna share exactly the same color balance. So either technique works uh, very, very nicely. Uh, is it possible to have the tint shifted by a relative amount <laughs> by minus two in a style similar to speed edit? So not similar to speed edit, that was Matthias Moses asking. Uh, but that's the way to do it. But a style cannot do a relative shift. It will always be an absolute number. Uh, one says, how much is this <laughs> webinar gonna last? Am I boring you? Hopefully not. Uh, not much longer actually. This won't be a full hour, probably another 15 minutes. I'd say we've got it uh, wrapped up. A uh, good question from Michael, can I make this with or not on layers? So with speed edit, it always operates on the background layer. Uh, if you are using uh, layers, then you could do the copy paste with a color balance tool. So that would work. Uh, I would just need to do the same thing with layers and copy that one across. But speed edit is always the background because there would be no real smart way in the interface to tell which image, which layer you want to use, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, we've got two other things to think about. We've got looking at black and white very briefly, and also as an alternative for correction. So let's look at correction, then black and white, and then that's us pretty much done. So we've got this photo, which you can tell straight out of camera, it's a bit well, very flat in contrast, uh, probably not the right color and all kinds of other things, lots of mountain air. So first of all, I'm just gonna crop it down a touch. And then exposure wise, it's actually fairly good. Let's try and get our white balance a bit warmer. I don't wanna go too warm because very quickly it goes in the wrong direction because it has that overall cast to it. So I'm gonna warm it up a little bit and I'm aiming to get this rock face kind of as close as, as I can, as I think I want it to be without pushing the colors too far in either direction. So it's still obviously super um, flat. So let's do a quick auto levels like so. Maybe we we'll bring up the exposure a bit. Now, because I touched the exposure, just need to touch levels again to make sure it's okay. So that's not a bad start point. And let's also have a bit of clarity. So I'm kind of happy with this tone. If we grab our, where are they? Our readouts, let's add some color readouts. So if we go over here and stick one there, let's stick one in the middle and let's have one on our snow. Okay, so what do I think about this? Well, we look at the shadows it's got quite a lot of blue in it. So it's maybe a little bit too much on the cool side. So let's fix that with the color balance tool. So we're gonna make a new field layer once again. Always good for flexibility, color, not color editor, color correction. Let's call it that. So my shadows have too much blue. So we're just gonna 
push it in the opposite direction and take some of that out. So if I let go, then if you can remember what this was before, so it had 53 points of blue, 31 of green. So if we go in this direction, like so, then we're just dropping the blue down. We've almost neutralized it, really. So if you want to keep a bit of coolness in there because it is a shadow, then you might want to back it off a bit, like so. Let's go over to the highlights. That's, you know, relatively blue as well, but I might want to emphasize that. Cold, chilly snow kind of thing. So we could actually add a bit more of that in. And for the mid-tones, that's this area, I also might like to add a bit of additional warmth in there as well. Uh, because it's going to annoy me, let's get rid of that dust spot so we don't have to look at it. And this one, there we go. Whoops, helps if you actually get it. There we go. Helps if you actually get it once again. Jeez, let's uh, do that once more, David. That was a poor effort. So let's make the brush a bit bigger and obliterate it. There we go, that's better. So now I'm happy with how that is with the color readouts looking. The only thing I might do on our background is just add a bit more contrast as well. And we can keep an eye on our numbers. Pretty happy with that. This is you know fairly neutral. It's maybe still a bit too cold. So if I go back to color correction and just pull this a bit further, like so. There we go, that's close. It's still got a slight cool edge to it, which is normal because it's a shadow. Midtones are nice and warm. Highlights relatively neutral as well. So looking at it before, no, that was pretty appalling out of camera and actually nicely corrected. Oh, look at that. The numbers change as we swipe back and forward too. That's pretty awesome. Lots of blue, not so much blue like so. But that's not what I would call a creative color grade. That's just bringing the photo, you know, to a nice normal start point. If I wanted to experiment with color grading, I would probably add a further field adjustment layer, call this one color grade, and then we could happily, you know, muck about and see what we wanted to do. Does the shot look better if it's warmer overall? Don't really think so. Does it look better if it's colder overall? Different emotion, I guess, but I wouldn't want to upset my color correction layer. I'd want to, you know, play around with it here and then at least we can dial that back, get rid of it if we didn't think it was any good and so on. Right, so that was a little bit about correction, so don't forget that. The color readouts are really super handy, so that's in this menu up here. Gives you an idea what's going on. You can just move them around. Uh, if you option click, then you can delete. If you right click anywhere with this cursor tool, we can zap all the readouts like so. So pretty handy shortcut too. Okay, next I said we wanted to look at black and white because it's probably a little known fact that the color balance tool works really nicely uh, on a black and white shot. So let's first of all make a cloned variant of this. So we've got a virtual copy. So we've got our original and then we've got our virtual copy like so. I'm gonna immediately convert that to black and white by ticking the box. Looks pretty good as it's a bit contrasty. It's gonna pull the contrast down a bit and the, is there any clarity? Yes, so let's pull that down a bit so his face isn't getting too contrasty. Uh, there's a clone layer here if you're wondering what that's for. That's just cheating and adding a catch light in his left eye because it was missing and I thought he looked a bit lopsided. So handy use of the clone layer if you wanna add an additional catch light or improve it based on the other one and so on. So now we can, I guess, split tone it or even triple tone it, but I would still once again do this on an adjustment layer. Let's call this toning. Toning, like so. Find our color balance tool. And what you'll find is these operate pretty much in the same way, but just by chucking a cast on the shadows, midtones, and highlights. Curiously, the master one doesn't actually do what you expect it does. I haven't actually got a good explanation for that, um, but suffice to say it doesn't add a color, it actually changes the contrast because of the underlying color. So the master and three-way operate slightly differently mechanically underneath. 
but if I did want to tone my shot, then we can pretty much dial in any color that we want. So if we wanted to warm it all up by the same amount, then we could just move the balls in the, the same direction. We could do opposites as well quite nicely. And it's a really you know interesting way to work with your black and whites. If you're bored of just having pure black and white, this is a nice way to chuck a bit of a tone in there as well. And the handles, they still operate as well if you want to play around with contrast too. So just consider that with your black and white photos too. Again, super simple, stick it on a separate layer because once more, if you've overcooked it, then you can always dull the opacity back and then pick any point in between, which seems to be a good compromise as well. One more thing, I think. What did I miss? I think we talked about using the color editor as well. Maybe we didn't. Did we throw in the color editor in on this shot? I'm forgetting myself. Yes, we did. So as I, as I think I said, don't restrict the color grading to the color balance tool. Uh, you can also throw in other factors like the color editor. Pretty sure maybe we played with saturation as well. So color grading is not purely related to just using the color balance tool. Now a different method, let's uh, reset this actually. What I tend to do is start from the center and work my way out till I have the effect that I think I'm looking for. Uh, one of my guests a few weeks back was Emily Teague. She's been on a few times, great friend of the house, runs our community, Capture One Creative Lab, which I recommend you join up. What she prefers to do as a way of seeking inspiration is let's get rid of our saturation for a minute so we can see the effect, is to jam the uh, correction all the way to the outer edge so it's the maximum effect. And then she navigates around the wheel and looks for inspiration thinking, okay, what's gonna work with this particular photo? Let's bring up the opacity as well. So does she prefer you know, a warm look on this shot? Does she prefer a cold look and so on? So she will walk it round the circle until she has you know, a pretty good idea of what she thinks works well with this shot. And then using the slider on the left hand side, we'll pull that down to reach a point where she also thinks it looks good. And then repeat the same with the midtones, you know, highlights uh, as well. So if that's a method that you prefer, then there's nothing to stop you playing around with it like that as, as well. Both work very nicely. <clears throat> Just had a brain fart. What was I gonna add to that? Uh, nothing, I don't think. But check out Emily's live stream. That was a few weeks ago. And then you can actually see what I'm talking about uh, with using the, the color balance tool in that way. Okay, finally, as I said, the hardest part of uh, color grading is not using the tool. It's more seeking inspiration of what kind of colors you might want to dial into a photo. I get tend to get very stuck on this kind of look, cooler shadows, warmer highlights and midtones. I think it looks nice. It's kind of a foolproof recipe a lot of the time. Uh, but there are, of course, an infinite number of other ways you, you can go. The best inspiration to seek for that is cinematography. Look at films that you appreciate in terms of their color palette. Um, look at TV productions that you appreciate in terms of their color palette. See who the cinematographer is. Um, have they written any articles about color grading? What kind of palettes do they seek? That's the best way to tune in to uh, various different color palettes and, and what looks great. So the technical part is easy. The creative part is unfortunately, like all things, a bit more challenging. But just experiment and see what you like. No one should tell you I don't like that color grade if you think it looks good on your photos. That's a nice uh, suggestion from Dominic I saw. Wouldn't it be cool if Capture One analyzes the colors in a picture and shows the dominant five colors so you can see if your colors are already complementary or where to edit to? That would be a nice, a nice option. Probably wouldn't be too difficult either to, to look at, examine and look at the color palette. So nice idea, Dominic. Uh, Alex says, can I synchronize the color grading adjustment 
made it, I'm working with more than one image, so they all have the same raw color and temperature. Hey Alex, yeah, easily just um, a copy paste. So if we wanted to color grade this on a, let's say we had a sequence of this guy screaming down the hill, then let's just take it on this one. So if we select these two shots, so we've got this one and this one, this is where my color grade is. So if I hit the copy apply button, so if I just hold my shift down and do that, then it just does the copy apply across. So let's just reset this one once more and show you again. So we've got our color grade on here, hold your shift key down, click on the little up down arrow and that will send it across. And you can do that with a sequence of 10, 20, 100, doesn't matter. So it's as simple as that. Can you save it as a style or preset? Yep, great question. And I'm gonna talk about some purely color grading presets in a second. So in the color balance tool itself, click on here and then you can say save custom preset. So if we just call this um, my grade, my great grade, like so. So that's on the three stack lines there. Now it shows up at the top. So I can go to any other picture. Let's go to this fella. Don't know if it's gonna work on this shot, but let's try. My great grade, and away we go. Actually doesn't look too bad. But just be aware, you know, as, as um, Dominic pointed out, different photos have different dominant colors. So not every color grade tends to be universal, but often it can be a great starting point. If you're looking for some inspiration, let's just reset that. Uh, there is a style pack called Spectrum, which we sell on CaptureOne.com. That has 15 different color grades with two different strengths. Some of them just use the color balance tool, some include the color editor as well. If you are gonna save your own styles or indeed buy the Spectrum pack, one little tip that you can do, if you find a color grade that you like, so let's go for this one, or the slightly stronger. Right click on it and say apply to new layer. Because what that will do is put the style on a layer. So then you can do the trick of dialing it back or playing with it yourself. What's this style actually doing? So it's pulled some stuff around uh, on, on the color balance tool. But if you then wanted to add you know, your own flair to it as well, then you could do so, but it's gonna be much easier if you right click on the style and then add it to a new layer. So do that, don't just apply it natively. Okay, I'm gonna check on the last couple of questions and then we are done. Um, Jim was saying, if I'm using Fujifilm profiles, would it be best to use a linear response for color grading? The profiles kind of include color grading anyway. I wouldn't have I wouldn't go to linear response if you're working with a Fujifilm. I mean, the Fujifilm film styles, if we bring up base characteristics, where are you? So, oops, sorry. So let's reset this guy. Let's bring up base characteristics. Let's just bump up the exposure a bit so we can actually see what we're doing. Uh, if we look at um, the curves here, so auto will use the film simulation that was set in camera. So let's just say you were using something pretty drastic like ProNeg or whatever. I wouldn't then go to linear response per se. What I would do is go to film standard because that's not using any film simulation. That's just using Capture One's defaults, if you like, or a default calibration. So if you want to do your own color grading, come off auto and go to film standard or high contrast or extra shadow is just a bit flatter. But linear response, that's probably a bit too aggressive. That just does give you a bit more power and control, but it will probably give you a bit more work in the long run and it's not always necessary. So Jim, go to that. Okay, so um, I think that concludes us for today. So I hope you enjoyed the little tour about color grading. As I said, the technical parts of it, super simple. 
the creative part always requires a bit more work. But the takeaways are work on a layer if you can, certainly helps. Use opacity to lessen the impact if you've gone a bit crazy. Don't be afraid to incorporate other tools like the color editor, saturation, contrast, or whatever into an overall color grade, which you can then adjust with your opacity slider. Play with black and whites with the color balance tool, gives really nice look uh, as well. And really, that's all there is to it. And just play experiment. There is no right or wrong way to use the color balance tool. So just go for it. And if you're on watching on YouTube and you want to know when we are always going live, don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell next to it. Uh, because whenever we go live, then you'll get a notification 30 minutes before and also at the time we go live as well. Uh, I'll be back next Tuesday with our ambassador, Paul Reefer. We're going to have a little look at the Apple M1 in action running Capture One because we're not far off having a native release to that. And we're going to talk about the practical benefits. So yes, it's nice to have a brand new computer, but what is the actual practical benefit to a photographer using an Apple M1 Mac? So that's what we're going to look at uh, with Paul on Tuesday. So check out on YouTube and Facebook. That's where it's going to play at 1700 Central European Summertime. So if you subscribe to YouTube, then you're not going to miss it. Take care, everyone, and see you all soon. Bye now.